<clears throat> so Anil ji, please let me know when I should start. You can you can start now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good morning. On behalf of the organizers, this is Srimayi welcoming you all to this online mini course on approximate solutions of operator equations and eigenvalue problems being organized by Indian women and mathematics. The four lectures of this mini course will be delivered by Professor Balmohan B. Limaye, Professor Emeritus at IIT Bombay. At the outset, I would like to thank everyone for the uh, response we received in terms of the number of applications for the mini course when we announced it online. I would also like to apologize for not being able to hold it as per the original schedule because we ran into some severe technical glitches at that time. But we feel very uh, encouraged uh, by the response that we are currently getting for the new dates. People are joining on the Zoom and YouTube as, as I speak. And thank you once again for your participation in this uh, lecture series. I would like to take the opportunity here to speak very briefly about Indian Women in Mathematics or IWM in short and its activities. Indian Women in Mathematics, uh, IWM is a collective of uh, Indian mathematicians that has been active for almost over a decade now. It is an initiative of the National Board for Higher Mathematics and is funded by the Department of Atomic Energy Government of India. For the past several years, some of the IWM activities have also been supported by the International Mathematical Union's Committee for Women in Mathematics. The main objectives of IWM are to provide an umbrella for activities related to training and outreach for women mathematicians. And some of the main deliverables are creating networking opportunities for women engaged in mathematics teaching and research, encouraging women to take up research careers in mathematics, strengthening regional groups and showcasing role models and encouraging and supporting mathematics research in institutes, colleges and universities all over the country. IWM has been actively organizing various events uh, all over the country for fulfilling these objectives. Since 2015, the activities of the IWM are being conducted by its executive committee, which currently comprises of 14 faculty members from mathematics departments of various Indian universities and institutes. The current chair of the committee is Professor Neela Natraj from IIT Bombay. She is here with us today. So is the founder chair of the executive committee, Professor Riddhi Shah. Thank you to Neela and Riddhi for taking the time to join us in this first lecture of our online mini course. IWM has been conducting one annual conference and at least two workshops every year since 2016 except in the year 2020, when the pandemic caused some disruptions. Apart from these, a visitor's program lecture series is also conducted in which women mathematicians from India and abroad deliver a series of talks and interact with young mathematicians in non-metro and sometimes uh, far-flung parts of the country. The pandemic has of course forced uh, us like many others to hold most of these activities either online or in hybrid mode. And uh, if you would like to see the, uh, the breadth of our activities across the country, their frequency or the quality of our, uh, of our programs, then you should visit our IWM webpage. I will give a link to the webpage uh, in the chat on the Zoom. And uh, you will be able to see that we are very active despite the pandemic. Uh, and uh, particularly in this year, we have already had one regional workshop in March at IIT Villa in hybrid mode followed by an annual conference at IIT Dharwar in online mode. We have also a number of activities lined up following this uh, mini course in the next two months. The, uh, the IWM Regional Workshop on Research and Opportunities will be held online uh, from December 4 to 5 at IIT Patna. The hosting institute is IIT Patna. And the last date to apply actually is uh, Monday, midnight of Monday actually is the time when you the applications will close for this event. I will share a link to the, uh, the website of that workshop and also the link to apply on the chat uh, of this event. Another uh, online uh, winter school for young women in mathematics will closely follow this uh, IWM regional workshop that will be held from 15 to 24 December and the organizing institute is IIT Kanpur. 
The last date to apply there is November 30. I will share the links uh, for this event also on the uh, Zoom chat. And further, the IDEO WM Annual Conference 2022 is coming up on 28th to 30 January and it will be held in online mode. The hosting institute will be Banasthali University. The registrations for this event will shortly open. Now, uh, let me introduce uh, the audience to the resource person of this mini course, Professor Didi Limay. I'm sure that to the vast majority of us, he needs no introduction whatsoever. And apart from, of course, the topic of the course, he is likely very much the reason for us participating in this course, or at least for many of us. And he wanted me to keep his introduction very brief, so I will not uh, list out the many laurels and achievements of his illustrious career in this uh, short intro. I am sure that a sizable number of participants have been introduced to functional analysis from his very well-written and popular textbook on the topic. He is an acclaimed researcher and acad academician, and Professor Limay has served his profession with great dedication for more than 50 years, and he's a much-loved, respected teacher and mentor and guide to students of mathematics, countless many, and his enthusiasm for teaching and research knows no bounds. We at IWM were uh, more than happy to uh, be able to take up his offer for our cause uh, to conduct this uh, course online despite the many challenges of our current times. So before I hand over the proceedings to Professor Limaye, I would like to just remind you all, uh, everyone, about the modalities for conducting the mini course. Um, the lectures are being streamed live on the IWM YouTube channel, and the recording of each lecture will remain available there. You are expected to maintain dignity and decorum at all times during your online interaction. Please do not post any material on the chat that is not directly related to the course. And please keep your video switched off and microphones on mute at all times, unless we specifically request you to switch them on. All questions about the lectures will be taken up at the end of each lecture. You can type your questions on the chat while the lecture is going on, both on Zoom and YouTube. And uh, there are four moderators for the smooth conduct of the discussion session at the end of each lecture where we will take up your questions. These will be picked up from the chat and posed to Professor Limay. The moderators are Dr. Puneet Sharma, Dr. Vishwajit Das, and Ms. Nandika Roy, apart from myself. If the need arises, participants with queries on the Zoom platform will be requested to unmute themselves in order to have uh, in interaction uh, with the speaker. For lecture one, the YouTube chat will be monitored by Dr. Puneet Sharma. So with these words, I would like to now hand over the proceedings to Professor Limay. Sir, we thank you very much for uh, taking up the uh, responsibility for teaching this course online. And we really look forward to, to your lectures. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm thankful to IWM for giving me this opportunity to share with you some of my thoughts and some of my <clears throat> work uh, with a larger audience. <clears throat> I think I had already mentioned that uh, there will be some background needed in uh, linear algebra, in real analysis, and some part of functional analysis. So the focus in these lectures is not on proving the results that you already know, but of telling how they can be used in a, a different kind of a setup, uh, setup, and I shall elaborate on that. <clears throat> so we shall begin with uh, finite dimensional linear algebra, go through a infinite dimensional process, and finally, in the last lecture, come back to finite dimensional linear algebra. So that is the overall journey that we shall undertake. So before any mathematical discourse, one has to set up some notation. And here is what I shall use, capital N with a extra bar to be the <coughs> set of all natural numbers, Z to be the integers, R to be the real numbers, and C to be the complex numbers. So that is the notation. Now comes the notation for matrices. <coughs> for a 
fixed natural number m, the set of all m by m matrices with complex entries will be denoted by C super m cross m. That m cross m says, the first m says m rows and the second m says m columns. All right. So if you have a matrix, m by m matrix, then it will be say A, it will be written as bracket Kij, where Kij is the entry in the i row and the jth column. This is standard. So there is uh, nothing further to explain. <clears throat> now, I want to also denote column vectors of length m. So they are, <clears throat> uh, the set of all such column vectors will be denoted by C super m cross one. You can see now, first m means it has m rows. A column vector has m rows and only one column. So m cross one is such a column vector u will be denoted by the column first entry u at one, second entry u at two and so on up to the last entry u at m. So here is a slight difference in the notation that you may have seen earlier. Usually you would write u sub one, u sub two, etc. There is a reason for not using the subscript here. <clears throat> so the first entry is really the value of the so-called function at the point one and so on. So that is how the notation of the column vector will be. All right. Now, the basic <clears throat> formula we use in matrix algebra and matrix analysis everywhere is how to multiply a matrix how to multiply by a matrix A, a column vector U. What you do, you look at the ith column of the matrix, take the inner product of the ith column with the column vector U, and whatever you get, the complex number, is the entry in the vector AU, the ith entry. So that is the formula. I want you to look at it very carefully because this formula, although we, we learn it in the very first lecture of a linear algebra and so on, is going to be very, very important. All sorts of generalizations of this formula will occur. So A of U at I is the summation J goes from one to M, Kij times U at J, all right? So this is important. <clears throat> now let's start with a matrix A and a fixed complex number Z, <clears throat> okay? Now there are two, Two possibilities. Z will be an eigenvalue or Z will not be an eigenvalue. So let me tell you what that is, although you may have already learned about this. Z is an eigenvalue of the matrix A if there is a non zero column vector U such that A sends U to Z times U. Right? The import, important point here is U is non zero because if U were zero, a of zero will be z times zero always. So every z would be an eigenvalue. That's not the case. So the vector u has to be non-zero. And any such vector is called an eigenvector. These are basic definitions. So a, given a complex number z, it is either an eigenvalue or it is not an eigenvalue. If it is an eigenvalue, then to find all eigenvectors of A corresponding to z, means you want to find all u such that a u equal to z u, which is the same thing as the equation I have written here, z u minus a u equal to zero. This is a system of m linear equations in m unknowns. All right. <clears throat> now let us take the next case when z is not an eigenvalue. If it is not an eigenvalue, then it means by definition, the only solution of this equation that I wrote above is z u minus a u equal to zero is the zero solution, right? This means the nullity of the matrix z i minus a is equal to zero, right? Nullity means the space uh, dimension of the null space. So a z minus a uh, z i minus a <clears throat> has nullity equal to zero because zero is the only solution for this one. Now you have a famous theorem in linear algebra, the so-called rank nullity theorem. What does it say? If you have a matrix M by M, then the rank of the matrix, which is the dimension of the range 
of the matrix and the nullity of the matrix, the sum of these two has to be equal to M. So in this case, the nullity is zero. So what will be the rank? The rank will be M. So in this case, the matrix A is what we call full the rank matrix. That means his image is the whole space. So this shows, as I had just uh, described to you, the <clears throat> matrix A is one to one because its nullity is zero and its rank is M. Therefore, its image is the whole space. What does it mean in terms of equations? It means for every complex, uh, every uh, M vector uh, V, every column vector V, there is a unique U such that AU, uh, ZU minus AU equal to V, all right? So you have two distinct cases here. The first case, there is a non-zero solution of ZU minus AU equal to zero. The right-hand side is zero. In the other case, for every right-hand side V, there is a unique U such that ZU minus AU equal to V, right? This is the dichotomy being an eigenvalue or not being an eigenvalue. What I want to say here is that both these cases, in both these cases, you are solving a system of equations. In the first case, to find out all eigenvectors, you have to solve that particular system of M equations in M unknowns. In the second case, you have a non-singular matrix and you have a unique solution for whatever right-hand side you are given. So both these cases are covered by <clears throat> this particular problem, given a vector V, a column vector V, find all column vectors U such that ZU minus AU equal to V, all right? So the eigenvalue case, as well as the non-eigenvalue case, both are covered by this particular system of equation, solution of system of equation. So we need to solve this. I'm not going to talk much about how to solve this, but I, let me remind you that, uh, so this is what I already explained to you, case one and case two. So let me, so how to solve these equations? Uh, <clears throat> the most uh, widely used and important method is the Gauss elimination uh, to solve this system of M equations in M unknowns. But keep in mind that not just Gauss elimination will give you very uh, useful results. Sometimes you have to do something called partial pivoting. That means you must choose the pivots. What are the pivots? Pivots are the first non-zero entries in a row. So you have to choose the pivots by interchanging the rows, which are large enough, or perhaps the largest one. So you have to put that row at the top and then work out the Gauss elimination method. So this is a standard method. There are many others, but I'm, I'm not going to describe them. So with partial pivoting, Gauss elimination methods definitely gives you a good enough result. May not be the most efficient, but it will give you. So whether it is an I, uh, Z is an eigenvalue or not, you can do Gauss elimination and get results. Question, important question or more difficult question is to decide which complex numbers Z are eigenvalues and which are not. That is a much more difficult task or to deal with that task, you have to solve the eigenvalue problem. And one of the standard methods of solving this, especially when A is a large matrix, say 1,000 by 1,000 matrix or 10,000 by 10,000 matrix, uh, and it is full. That means there are lots of non-zero entries. That's what we mean by full. Then the QR method, and just like Gauss elimination itself will not give you always desired results, you had to use partial pivoting. QR method, there are certain shifts that, that one can introduce, that means subtract a multiple of identity and then it will work. <clears throat> now, while doing both these things, that is Gauss elimination and QR method, using these methods, there are two things one has to keep in mind. So I have written it as a caution. <clears throat> these two things are conditioning and stability. I will tell you in one or two sentences what these are. And unless you pay enough attention to these two aspects, you will end up with, uh, the, you may end up with some answers, but they will be meaning, meaningless and so on. Conditioning means 
if you perturb the data slightly, whether the solution is going to be perturbed, to what extent it is going to be perturbed. If it is going to be perturbed, that is going to be changed to a very large extent, then that kind of a matrix one should avoid the dealing with. So you, you, have, you must have heard about condition number and so on. If you have a non-zero matrix A, then the condition number A of that matrix is norm A times norm of A inverse and so on. It is The condition number is at least one. If it is close to one, it's good. If it is bigger than 10, it's not so good, etc. So this kind of reasoning is called forward error analysis. And there is also a backward error analysis that is known by the stability of the problem. It means that using a computer or by some other way, you find a, you find a solution. It may not be the exact solution you are looking at, but is it the exact solution of a slightly perturbed problem? So if that is the case, you are happy that at least what I have found fits as a exact solution of a slightly different data. And so, on. so these two things have to be kept in mind. These are not emphasized very often in your standard course in linear algebra. So I thought I should uh, take an opportunity to emphasize the importance of this. Now, having said a lot of things or some things about finite dimensionality, let us go over to infinite dimensional analog of the same, same situation and so on. So what does that mean? The matrix earlier A was a finite matrix. Its domain was finite dimensional and its range was also finite dimensional. So now we want to open up. We would allow infinite dimensional domain and infinite dimensional operator. So I will take X as a <coughs> linear space over C. So it's possibly infinite dimensional, maybe finite dimensional, but I'm allowing infinite dimensionality. And T is a linear operator, just like. A matrix A is a linear transformation from C M to C M. Similarly, T is a linear map from the linear space X to linear space X. So what has changed? Only the dimensionality has changed. Just like the matrix is a linear map, this is a linear operator. We call it an operator. You can call it a map if you want. Now, just as we fixed the number, complex number Z earlier, let us pick that, pick that number Z. And now we consider the same problem that we wrote earlier. What was the earlier problem? I will repeat. The earlier problem was given a column vector V, find all column vectors U such that ZU minus AU equal to V, right? We just saw that. What I have done here, instead of V, I have written Y. It is an infinite dimensional vector. You have to find X, which are infinite dimensional vectors, such that the same kind of equation, instead of Z U minus A U equal to V, I have written Z X minus T e X equal to Y. So nothing has changed except for the dimensionality. Now the question is, how does one solve? Now, earlier, if you saw, solving the system of M equations in M unknowns, we had two powerful methods. What were the two powerful methods? Gauss elimination and for the solution of the system and to decide which Z gives you one case or the other case, the QR method. In this case, those two methods are not available. So we have to do something. So before I do that, let us look at the two cases that we saw earlier, that is something not being an eigenvalue and something being an eigenvalue. I'm rewriting the same thing. There is really no change. So case one corresponding to earlier case one, for every y, there is a unique x such that zx minus tx equal to y. What does that mean? It means if you look at the map or the operator, z times identity minus the operator t here. See, zx minus tx. z times identity, z times identity minus t. For every y, there is a unique u, means this map, z i minus t is one to one or two. That is the first case. That was the case earlier also. The second case will be, it is either 
not one to one or not on to is it not first case is both one to one and on to the second case is either not one to one or not on to so when it is not one to one that means there is a non zero x such that zx minus px equal to 0 that is not one to one now in the finite dimensional case if it is not one to one then it is automatically not on to because of the rank nullity theorem unless the vector space or linear space x is finite dimensional you do not have the rank nullity theorem so if a <clears throat> map is not one to one you cannot say it is not on to it can be not one to one not on not on to not one to one on to and on to but not one to one all possibilities are there so the case one is slightly more complicated than the finite dimensional case okay so let me read the second case Sec either there is a non zero x such that zx minus px equal to 0 or there is some y for which there is no x which solves it. that is there is no solution to the operator equation so you have to consider both these cases so this is an added added uh, complication in the finite dimensional case and the reason as i told you there is no rank nullity theorem that that is that is why this happens now to deal with this situation it is convenient you now this is where the analysis starts so far it was algebra it is convenient to have a norm on your vector space or on your linear space and i assume you are familiar with the first part of functional analysis that's what you do even in linear algebra courses you talk about norms and so on so there is a norm on x and i shall assume that the norm is complete what does that mean that means the metric induced by the norm is complete means what every Cauchy sequence converts such a space is called a Banach space so my setup will be <coughs> instead of cm to cm which was the finite dimensional case i will look at maps from x to x instead of a matrix a i will look at operators which are linear from x to x but i will assume something more about the operator so far i have assumed only the operator is linear but I shall assume that the operator is continuous. What does continuous mean? It means whenever a sequence xn converges to x in the domain, the image sequence t of xn will converge to t of x. Okay. What does xn converging to x mean? It means the norm of xn minus x tends to zero. What does t of xn converging to tx mean? It means the norm of txn minus tx equal to zero. I, uh, I assume that you are familiar with these things. I'm just reminding you these notices. There are other ways of talking about continuity and I will talk about it, but I think this is the simplest <coughs> definition of continuity. Take a sequence, xn converging to x, check whether the image sequence t of xn converges to t of x, not somewhere else. This is continuity. All right, in the case one, <coughs> when for every y there is a unique x and so on this com continuous operator it means one to one and there is a famous theorem one to one on two that means if the map is bijective there is a famous theorem known as bounded inverse theorem which means that the inverse is continuous this is not automatic one has to do some proving and some basic results are needed because if you have a bijective map, one to one on two map, which is continuous, the return map, that is the inverse map, need not be continuous in general. If it is the, the map is not linear, it is very often the inverse is not continuous. Even if the map is linear, coming back map is not necessarily continuous. And one can give examples in our functional analysis course, we give these examples. I'm not going to do that now, but just to be, uh, alert you that there is some basic result used here so that the inverse of a continuous linear map is continuous. So that is case one. In case two, there are two possibilities. So what are the possibilities? Zi minus T is not one to one and zi minus 2 is 1 to 1. So when zi minus t is not 1 to 1, 
we call z an eigen eigen value okay and both these cases whether it is not one to one or not on to such a vector in the case 2 such a complex number z is called a spectral value so a spectral value is a general more general notion than the eigen value a spectral value is an eigen value z if the map zi minus k is not one to one if it is one to one still it may not be on to in which case it will not be an eigen value but it will be a spectral value so there are some extra considerations come in when you talk about infinite dimensional cases <clears throat> all right so given z now we want to find the solutions of zx minus tx equal to y right this is also called predon operator equation all right in the earlier case we had the gauss elimination method we can't have, we don't have any such thing here so we have to scratch our head and see what to do what how to go about similarly the earlier case also the difficult problem was to locate those complex numbers which are eigen values here also the same problem locate those complex numbers which are spectral values they may be eigen values they may not be but they are spectral values <clears throat> to locate them is not a easy job that means to find the spectrum of the operator is a very very important uh, consideration but there are no easy ways of doing that so before i <clears throat> go about telling you how to deal with these difficult problems and so on that is solution of the operator equation and deciding which are again values which are spectral values and so on before i do that in order to sort of um, play ground level field i want to give you some typical examples of infinite dimensional banach spaces and continuous operators i think these examples you may have seen already but even if you have please go with them go with me through those examples because unless you have very specific examples in mind writing a theory theorem corollary lemma they all become meaningless unless you can visualize them in concrete examples so i want to give you two or three typical examples of infinite dimensional situations all right so here we go now as i said the basic equation is the matrix equation what was the matrix equation a ith row multiplied by a column a of u that is the ith entry of the image vector au is the summation j goes from 1 to m k i j u j what does that say take the inner product of the i throw with the column vector all right so this i had emphasized earlier this is the crucial now we want to go from finite dimensional <coughs> spaces to infinite dimensional spaces what do we do very simple look here i am looking at the i th entry right i goes from 1 to m now i may have infinite entries what does that mean i should allow i to go from 1 2 3 and dot 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 not stop at m correct that is one now the vector itself was finite dimension is it not i goes from 1 to m now i am allowing i to go bigger but the e, here i am allowing the image to be uh, to be bigger but i can allow j also j also the basic vector not stopping at m j goes from 1 to m i can allow j goes from 1 to infinity that's all so that will give you a concrete infinite dimensional situation where the same formula when you allow this m to go to infinity and this summation m also go to infinity you will get a very good example of infinite dimensional situation now there are problems in the finite dimensional situation i can sum up from j goes from 1 to m if i start summing up j goes from 1 to m i don't know whether it becomes a series right and the whether the series will converge or not so you have to take care of those also 
a of u when i goes from not just 1 to m it will go from 1 to infinity then you have a vector which has infinitely many components right whether that vector belongs to x x is your basic space the map goes from x to x so these things are important and they have to be considered so i will give you one situation where everything works it is not the only situation there are many situations but i will give you one situation and it is also the most standard one so the situation is take x to be the linear space of all square summable sequences what does that mean for me a sequence will be x at 1 x at 2 and so on remember i told you the change in notation my vectors are not given with subscripts x is the sequence so the first entry of the sequence is x at 1 the second entry is x at 2 and so on so square summable means look at the absolute values of the entries take their square sum them up that should be final so this is the l2 space little l2 space they call it. okay the basic space infinite dimension space is x now for a vector x with these entries here that vector has to belong to l2 is it not that means what the uh, it must satisfy this equation that is uh, this uh, restriction j goes from 1 to infinity xj is finite so let us take such a vector now one can check that l2 is complete in the matrix induced by this norm this is a norm because i said we shall want norm vector spaces and banach spaces so this is a complete matrix With this, with respect, to, induced by the norm and so on, so everything is satisfied. Now I have to tell you, I have to tell you <clears throat> how to go about forming these sums. So here I could take any entries k i j, right? There was no restriction, only finitely many entries. But now I am going to take infinite sums. So I take the the, the matrices of the uh, the entries of the matrix are going to be such that the square sum of the absolute values if you sum them up it is it is finite so now here is a description because of the infinite dimension or dimensionality of the problem when you do that then the definition of the operator is exactly the same as before let us go back and see here here a of u at i that means the ith entry here also t of x at i that means the ith entry how is it obtained by taking the inner product with i throw and the column vector here it is exactly the same inner product that means k i j x j but now j goes from 1 to infinity and now i here was to go from 1 to m now here i goes from 1 to infinity so the infinite dimensional operator is a analog exact analog of the finite dimensional matrix equation okay now we have to do some uh, proving what is the proving that if x is in l2 then this new tx that is the image vector it is also in l2 you have to do, uh, talk about that you have to prove that also we have to prove that this t is continuous because we wanted continuous from this all that has to be done and i, I hope sometime or the other you have seen it uh, seen it before and uh, i shall leave it at that and i shall so this is an example of a infinite matrix defining an operator from l2 little l2 to little l2 which is an infinite dimensional space it is modeled over the finite dimensional matrix absolutely no change i want to you know, emphasize this because infinite dimensional things can be very crazy but let us deal with infinite dimensional things which naturally come out of the finite dimension all right so this is one example second example before i show you what that is it is also very very similar to this matrix thing in fact very very similar to the first example except that in the first example you have discrete values what i mean by discrete x is l2 that means it is a sequence so the first entry second entry third entry is a discrete situation right instead of little l2 you look at capital l2 what does that mean all square summable functions measurable functions on the interval 0 to 1 or a to b so 
instead of capital X equal to L2, I will have instead of sequences, I will have square summable functions. So let me start. And I just want to come back to this again and show you that I'm going to do an analog of this discrete situation in the case of the continuous situation. So here, X is capital L2, square summable sequences. So these are measurable functions from AB to complex numbers. What was the earlier case in little l2? Square summable. Sums of the squares of the entries should be finite. What is the analog here? Take the square of the value of the function. Instead of summing, you integrate, right? From the discrete situation to go to the continuous situation, what you do? Replace the variable j by a the discrete variable j by a continuous variable t, okay? Instead of summing, you take the integral, that's all. Now let's proceed in the same fashion and see what we get, okay? <clears throat> now capital L2, earlier it was square summable sequences. You should have now square integrable function. In exactly as before, the norm is complete and uh, it's, a, it's complete in the matrix defined by the norm. Earlier we took the entries of the matrix Kij, not, not any but the sums of the entries of the matrix, sorry, the squares of the sums of the matrix, if you sum them up, it should be finite. What will that mean here? Earlier it was double summation Kij, right? Now here is double integral. Instead of I, I'm writing S. Instead of J, I'm writing T. Earlier I sum with I goes to infinity, J goes to infinity. Now I integrate, over S from A to B and T from A to B. So it is the exact analog, continuous analog of the situation that we dealt with earlier, okay? <clears throat> Most important is the operator. For a given L2 function and the point S in the domain, what is T, uh, T of X at S? Recall earlier, T of X at J was summation j goes from 1 to infinity, instead of that you have integral a to b, k, i, j, instead of i, uh, s, instead of j, t, x, j, instead of x, j, I have x, t. Is there a difference? No difference. Simply replace the discrete variable i by the continuous variable s. Replace the discrete variable j by the continuous variable t, and you get this new operator, this is known as the integral operator. So integral operator are not some unknown, you know, very strange thing, it looks like a big name, no, integral operator. They are just constructed out of matrices by replacing the discrete variables by continuous variables. So this is the second example that I want to, want to tell you. So this K here is called the kernel, by the way. This is called an integral operator. This is called a kernel. In the earlier case also that Kij, you could call it a kernel, but they won't call it it's just a matrix and so on. So this is the second example. The third example is very similar to the second example, except that instead of the <coughs> uh, basic space being square summable free sequence, uh, sequences and so on, you take continuous functions. Sorry, square summable function, uh, measurable function. If you are not familiar with uh, major theory and so on, to say, oh, I don't know what is measurability, etc. Forget about all that. Just look at continuous function and do exactly what, what, what we did before. Exactly whatever is here, exactly same formula. There is no change except that the basic space, instead of being capital L2, that is square summable measurable functions, you look at continuous functions. And then we, we go along. So except that now you have to have a different norm. Earlier it was the two norm. Here we have the supremum norm. We have this very strong norm. And with this norm, <clears throat> you take a function k. Earlier, what was the function we required to satisfy? Some summability criterion was there. Here I want, want it to be a continuous function in two variables. Uh, it's a jointly continuous function. This fun function is continuous on AB cross AB. And then the same formula. Is there a change in the formula? No, formula is the same. The domain is CAB, so X comes from CAB, then the range should be continuous there. 
the one can prove that because of the kernel being continuous, the range that is the t of x is also a continuous function. And again, it's called the integral operator, right? And with the kernel k. So I have given you three infinite dimensional examples. Let me recall, uh, <clears throat> recount. First is little l2, square summable sequences and the mat infinite matrix operator. Second, continuous analog of this first example, right? Namely, from capital L2 to capital L2, you have an integral operator. Third, same as the second, except that you look at continuous functions and the kernel should be continuous. All right. So let's keep these three examples in mind because whatever I'm going to do is going to relate to these things. Now the question is, how do we find solution? That is what we, before I gave you the examples, I talked about it. There is no Gauss elimination. There is no QR method. What do we do? We have really no way to start except to say, ah, I know how to use Gauss elimination, how to use QR method when I'm in a finite dimensional situation. So even if I'm in an infinite dimensional situation, can I do some truncation? Can I just do, do some stopping instead of going all the way to infinity, stop at some place and see if it gives me something and so on. That is called <clears throat> approximate solution. So we are forced to look for approximate solution, not because we want to look at approximate solution. No, we want to look at exact solution. We'll be very happy if we can find exact solution. Unfortunately, there are no standard ways and there are no methods like Gauss elimination or QR, which will help us. So we are forced to look at approximate methods. Why will they work? They will work if we can apply those methods successfully. What is meant successfully? Means we should get the result we want, not some approximation, which is going nowhere. So these are the um, uh, considerations that we have to keep in mind. So I call it a three-step procedure for dealing with a continuous linear operator on a Banach space. We are to look for approximate solutions, but we have to follow a certain procedure in order to say that, huh, I could not find an exact solution, but I do have an approximate solution. And I can tell you how approximate it is. That means how much it is close to the exact solution. Then it should be okay, no? Because I, I can prescribe some, <clears throat> I can prescribe some, error and if the approximate solution is within that error then i should be happy because i have to be happy because i cannot find exact solution all right so what is the what is this three step procedure first procedure instead of the operator t continuous operator t from an infinite dimensional space to infinite dimensional space look for a sequence of operators which are continuous all right as before but they are finite rank operators. What does finite rank means? You know the rank of a matrix? Rank of a matrix means the range, the dimension of the range, right? Similarly, finite rank operator means the domain of Tn may be infinite dimensional, but the range of Tn is finite dimension. So these are known as finite rank. So I look for finite rank operators Tn, which I have written into inverted commas, approximate the operator t. I don't know what that means now. And I'm going to tell you what it should mean and so on. <clears throat> okay. But in some way it approximates. But then even if it approximates t, I should be able to solve the problem for tn, is it not? That means for tn, the rank is finite dimension. That's good. But the domain is infinite dimension. So I have to handle that also. And suppose I solve the problem for tn, then do I get an approximate solution of the given problem? So this is the second one. In case one, that is whenever there is a unique solution for the right-hand side Y, a unique solution X, maybe, maybe for Tn also, for a given right-hand side Y, I will have a unique solution X. I have to first ensure that. So if Z is such, that for every y, there is a unique solution x as far as the 
operator equation with t is involved, the same thing should happen for Tn. That is one. In case two, if you have a spectral value lambda of t, if I am able to find spectral value lambda n of Tn, will it converge to lambda? So whatever I find, are they approximations of the exact solution? That is the second step I have to make sure. And the third, of course, even if the first and two, first and second are satisfied, that means somehow I'm able to find finite rank operators whose solutions will give me approximations of the exact solution. Suppose I do that. Still, how to solve the finite rank problem? Can we do it with the earlier method? Well, QR method and the Gauss elimination will not work because the domain is infinite dimensional. So now, from infinite dimensional domain, I want to chop down to finite dimensional domain. That means I must reduce the problem where the domain is infinite dimensional to a problem where the domain is finite dimensional. That means essentially a matrix eigenvalue problem. The moment I accomplish the third step, I mean, I am in business. Why? Because then I can use Gaussian elimination. I can use QR method. Do, do you follow me? So this is the procedure we shall go through. I think I started about 10 minutes late. So uh, I will uh, take maybe five or 10 minutes. And I want to give you a <clears throat> look at what is called numerical functional analysis. So we are now dealing with numerical functional analysis. This is operator approximation theory. It is a part of numerical functional analysis. The reason I want to complete it now is that I hope you have found the first lecture so far understandable and so on. The second lecture is will take you in deeper waters and I want to have sufficient time to talk about the deeper water. So I want to give you a glimpse of where we are going. So I shall do that now. Uh, that's okay, no, Srimai? Uh, I can take five or ten minutes more. I hope. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Of course. You please yes. carry on. Oh, we started ten minutes late, so I. Yeah, think... no problem, sir. No problem, sir. Okay, so I will give you a glimpse of what uh, operator approximation theory is. Actually, we have already talked about it, but uh, let me say a few more words. So we begin with a <coughs> continuous linear operator P on a Banach space. And we want to solve, as I have been saying, operator equation and eigenvalue problems. Both the things I, I want to deal with. Now, as I said, the task is difficult. So we, in fact, sometimes not just difficult, impossible. There is no way of going about it. So we need to find a sequence of continuous operators, which are simpler to deal with. What does simpler mean? Simpler can mean anything, for example. If you have an infinite matrix, right? And suppose it is a full matrix. Full means there are hardly any zeros there, right? So it's full. Now, if you can introduce lots of zeros, then the, it's likely that the operator will become simpler. For example, in the infinite matrix, keep all the rows up to the nth rows as they are, okay? After the nth rows, put all the rows to be zero. That is one way of introducing zeros, one way of making the matrix simpler. Or instead of the rows, look at columns. Keep all the n columns as they are. After the nth column, put all zeros. Okay, so it's likely that our calculations will be simpler and maybe we can come up with a methodology to deal with this. Or you can do both. Keep only the first n rows and the first n columns. This top left triangle, you keep it as it is and put everything zero. Then you have very few entries to deal with, is it not? At the end stage, you have an n by matrix really, is it not? So that is what I mean by simpler. It depends on the situation what is simpler. So look at simpler, uh, simpler operators Tn, which will approximate the operator T. Now, what is meant by T approx Tn approximating T? 
So that means in some sense, Tn should be close to T. So we should have some measure of distance between two operators. Okay. For that, we need to talk about what is called the operator norm. T, the op operator norm of T is the supremum of T of X. The norm of T of X, where the supremum is calculated over the unit sphere. I hope you are familiar with this. Sometimes instead of the unit sphere, they take it unit ball. That is norm of X less than or equal to one. But it doesn't make any difference. It is the same. So I'm taking a non-zero vector X, so I can look at this. So if you have the norm T and another operator Tn, then they should be close to each other. What does that mean? We shall talk about that a little later. Now, if you look at this operator norm, it is easy to see that uh, norm of Tx is less than or equal to norm T into norm X. This is called the basic inequality. And from that, it will follow that <clears throat> if you have two operators T and S, then the norm of the composition is less than or equal to product of the two norms. These are basic things. And let me introduce what is called the spectrum. I have talked to you about the spectrum, right? What is the spectrum? The number two case. That means the operator Z i minus t is either not one to one or not not on to. That means it is not objective, not bijective. So it can be injective but not surjective, surjective but not injective. So this is called the spectrum. Sigma t I will denote by it. Okay. A part of the spectrum is the set of eigenvalues. When lambda i minus t is not injective, that is not one to one. So those are the eigenvalues. But in general, I have to do, deal with this whole situation. Instead of Z, it is standard to use the word lambda. Lambda is the element of the spectrum. So lambda can be an eigenvalue and so on. The complement of this spectrum is called the resolvent set. So let us see what that means. It means complement of the set means spectrum means the operator Z i minus T is not bijective. Complement means the operator Z i minus T is bijective. And as I said, by the bounded inverse theorem, if you have a bijective map, its inverse will be continuous. Also. Okay, so I'm not going to talk much about this, but this resolvent set, right, is an open set. It is the complement of the spectrum. So there are ways of proving this, but Outcome of this is the spectrum is a closed set. It's also a bounded set, but let, let me go. So these are the two notations, or this is the, well, the second will come a little later. I'm going to introduce. Uh, <clears throat> if you have a complex number Z, which is in the resolvent set, what does that mean? Z i minus T is bijective. Then it's, that means it's inverse exists. And by the bounded, in inverse theorem, this in inverse is continuous. That means it belongs to BLX. What is BLX? Bounded linear operator. BL does not mean Balmond Limayer. Some people used to tease me about it, but <laughs> bounded linear operator, and it is not my choice. It has been used uh, very poor. All right. So when this inverse exists, there is a shorthand notation for dealing with the inverse. So when you fix the operator T, right, let us fix the operator T, then the inverse of ZI minus T is denoted by RZ. Why this capital R? Capital R says that it is the resolvent operator. So this is known as the resolvent operator. In this notation, I should really have T here. But if I fix a T, then I will not keep, up, not keep on writing it. So Rz means Z minus I T inverse, okay? And the function Z going to Rz is a continuous map from the resolvent set T to the space BLX. This, this needs some proving, but it follows by the bounded inverse theorem and similar <coughs> notation. Now, having fixed the notation, the second notation is automatic. Instead of T, I look at the operator Tn. So everything the same, and I will call the resolvent operator of Tn by R sub n. Okay, so here Rz means Zi minus T inverse, and R sub n 
z means z i minus t n inverse. So when I want to deal with the approximate op operator t n, I will say r n z. That is the resolvent operator at z. Z has to be in the resolvent set of T n. Then only I can take the inverse, right? Z has to be in the resolvent set of T n. Here, Z was in the resolvent set of T. So Z i minus T, instead of writing Z i T inverse, this is a shorthand notation. Nothing more than that. So what is R Z? Resolvent operator of T at Z. What is R n Z? Resolvent operator of T n at Z. Okay, this is just this is just the notation. And I think I will stop at this notation. I will start the next lecture by telling you how we can use this resolvent operators and what kind of approximations of Tn we shall look for, which will give us what we want. So I will list four questions in the next lecture. And those four questions I would like affirmative answers. If those answers are affirmative, there is a point in going ahead with the setup. The answers are not affirmative, then we'll have to quit. We'll have to look for some other way of approximation. So, so I will give you two such cases, one which doesn't work, which is simpler, but which doesn't work, and one which almost works. Okay, nothing works perfectly, but I will give you a situation which is quite likely to work and so on. So I will talk about these two things. So the next lecture is, as I said, into much deeper water than what we have just seen. Let's see how it goes about it. So I stop now. If there are any questions and if you have raised any queries and so on, uh, I will be. So I will uh, stop sharing the screen now and uh, let's see what happens. Okay, I leave the. Uh, good morning, sir. Yes. Sir, I have one question. I'm Dinesh Kumar. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, at one point of your talk, you mentioned that if you have a full matrix. Yes. Then, um, you know, for the first end rows, the below entries can be made zero. Uh, yes. So, sir, I could not get how I... it can be done. It can be done with you. You can just put zeros. There is nothing. Whether whether it will work, it, it, whether it will give you what you want. What you want, you want to be able to solve the situation, solve the problem after putting the zeros. No? How to put zeros? Just write down zeros. K I J put it equal to zero. Huh? After okay. I equal to N, put zero. That is not a problem. Having done that, huh? and if you are able to solve that new problem with all those zeros. The problem, does it give a solution which is close to the solution that you want without the zeros? Understand, no? Yes, yes. That I will explain to you. Why, why it will work or why it will not work. Okay? So that is the main point. Putting zeros is what? Just put zeros. But whether that is that gives you something meaningful, that is the question. Is it not? So that I will, that I will explain. In one situation, it will not work. In another situation, it will work and so on. So what are those situations? That means what kind of approximation you should look for. By putting those zeros, gives you an approximation, right? You put zeros after the 10th row, for example. That is one approximation. Then you put zeros after the 15th row, right? That should be a closer approximation because you have allowed more entries to remain, is it not? If you go on doing this, will it keep on giving you solutions which are near and near to the exact solution. That is the question. And that I will try to answer in the next lecture. Good, good question. Can I Thank ask you, a related question? Hello, Professor Lumai, this is Riddhi. Yes. I want to ask, uh, is it a better approximation if you put zeros in rows and columns or if you put zeros in both rows and columns, like make it end by end? That would be easier to handle anyway. Right? It will be easier, but you will be losing a lot of data. What is the data? All the entries of the matrix, right? Yeah. You have kept only n by n, but you have lost much of it. So, it is but you are anyway going to take some limit, right? So, oh, yeah, but... yeah, yeah, but 
the TN will approximately mm. the TN will go much slower because you have lost you have lost because you are finally when n is large you are taking care of more and more uh, uh, yeah. okay. that is true but in, if you keep all the entries after the nth row for example you have kept in the first step itself you have kept so many entries so the data is with you okay okay so but be, anyway you can't handle infinitely many you can that's what, that's what i want to show you next time Okay, so another uh, question I have is you gave those three examples, right? Yes. About uh, giving summation and all. But yes. those are necessary, uh, those are sufficient conditions to yes. prove, but necessary, so there could be others. Which oh, we... many, many, many. So yes. I just, so, okay, so instead of L2, you can take LP. Hmm. And there are other conditions under, I mean, instead of that square summability, you have other conditions and that will do. There are many. I just. No. One example. Yeah, but square summability is only a sufficient condition or yeah. would it be necessary? That's what I'm saying. Precisely. Precisely. I gave you one condition. Ha, okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Lovely lectures. And it's always a pleasure to learn from. Okay. Yes. Good morning, sir. I have a question. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, the, uh, you suppose if, if Tn is a approximation of T. Yes. Uh, then uh, do you have any relation between the resolvent set of Tn and the resolvent set of T? <laughs> yes, there is. And that is the main, main point to be considered. How the resolvent set of Tn is close to the resolvent set of T. First of all, I will write down those four questions, you know. Okay, okay. So those questions one by one will take care of uh, this kind. So that we should be able to work, you know, just starting with a Z in the resolvent set of T. Is no good unless Z is in the result is in the result. Yeah, state. yeah, we don't know whether it's in what or not. Yes. Yeah, if it is not, then we stop. We cannot yes. yeah, yeah. We have to ensure many things. So those I will explain in the next lecture. But okay. in the next lecture, I will I have written down the proofs. You can see that slides later. Okay. okay. I don't intend to go through the proofs because uh, they are rather involved. I will okay. explain to you the basic idea, but uh, you can see this. Okay. 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 Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Okay. So uh, hello, sir. sir. I have a question. Yes. Uh, so, sir, actually, we are talking about uh, approximate solutions of operator equations, yes. and you also have mentioned that uh, it's difficult to find the exact solution of operator equations, right? Yes. So, uh, so how can we say that? which approximate solution is better if you don't know the exact solution yes so suppose x is the let's take the case one when for every y there is a unique x etc okay that is case one the case two okay. is the eigenvalue case or the spectral value case let's look at the first case so you find a solution xn okay with a approximate operator tn right then you can measure the distance between this xn and the exact solution x. Okay. Now, okay. you cannot, see, you don't know x. So how can you measure the distance? You can't. Right. You can find an upper bound on xn minus x. The norm of xn minus x, you can find an yes. upper bound. And how All big right. that upper bound, how small that upper bound, so one has to go by that. Because if you don't know x, how can you measure the distance? Is it not? Right, right. You have to go by the upper bound. So at That's least, fine. at least what I'm going to do in the next lecture and the one after is that whether norm of xn minus x tends to zero, how fast it tends to zero is the next question, which is important. But first yes. of all, at least we should ensure that it tends to zero. Then there is a point in going about it, is it not? So mm -hmm. this question I will try to answer in the Okay, okay, thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, sir, there is one question on the chat. Okay. And uh, I'm not sure I'm able to pronounce the name of the individual. It is Manraj Ghuman. Okay. Um, the question is uh, when can you write a linear operator on an infinite dimensional space yes. as an infinite matrix? As an infinite? When can you not do that? No, no, no. What is the not, question? When can you write as a what? A, an infinite, an, a linear operator on an infinite dimensional space yes. as an infinite matrix. Oh. And if, uh, if 
If not, can every linear operator be approximated by an infinite matrix? Yes, okay. The answer is to be able to write it as a infinite matrix, the basic space, the infinite dimensional space on which you are starting with the operator T, that space should be a sequence space. If it is not a sequence space, you cannot write it, uh, the operator in terms of an infinite matrix. So if the basic space is a sequence space, I hope you know what is a sequence space, like L2, square summable sequences, it is a sequence space. L1, little L1, that is sigma mod xn is finite, that is L1 or LP. So these are sequence spaces. There are others also, but they are not perhaps Banach spaces. So all, look at all sequences which are convergent. That is a sequence space. So if the basic space is a sequence space, then you can hope to write the matrix, uh, the operator on such a sequence space in terms of infinite matrix. Okay. Now there are conditions under which that matrix will represent the operator. So it will go like I gave you one 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 condition. If you have L two as the sequence space, and if the matrix entries of the matrix are pair then it will re represent a continuous operator. So it goes. There is no general answer to what you are asking. But first, I will say that the basic space has to be a sequence space. If it is a function space that is set of all continuous functions, you cannot hope to write an operator on a set of continuous functions by a matrix. Okay? So the right. participant may yeah. unmute himself or herself uh, in order to uh, interact with the speaker, with Professor Limay. If the participant is here still, you may unmute yourself and indicate whether you are uh, satisfied with the answer. Um, so, hi, so I, I had asked this question. Uh, oh, hello. Hello. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? So do you have any further query? So, I, uh, so this was like, you had introduced these three examples in the beginning. Uh, can, you, can you hear me? It's, yeah, we can hear you, but there's some uh, issue with your audio. Can you speak a little bit closer to your microphone? Is it, is it better now? Yes, slightly better, yes. So, uh, so this, you are like, you, you have started with some three examples and one is an infinite dimensional matrix and then you have, uh, you have gone to uh, writing the operator in some specific form with some integral and some kernel type of function and then some constraint you have put on that kernel and stuff so then what i'm i was sitting you're trying to approximate the solutions and stuff so i am trying to ask that is is this procedure also somewhat uh, possible for other uh, in ge a general linear operator like you like like you have in dynamical systems that uh, you can uh, you know the matrices are dense uh, the the ones with the eigenvalues. So if you probably solve the, some problem for dynamical system with a matrix with which has all the eigenvalues, then you are pretty close to the probably the solution. So is is that the case here also? Maybe if you have any linear operator, you don't know its general form, you can approximate it by its solution by some solution for some operator in some similar form, like the form in example three. Okay, let me answer. So certainly it is possible, but it will depend on the situation. You know, um, given an, given a particular specific operator, how to find approximations of that operator by doing what, etc., will entirely depend on that operator, is it not? You cannot write down general conditions under which this will work or this will not work. So you have to look at specific conditions. I gave you only three examples, which are natural to start with, but I, I, I know in dynamical systems and so many other things, you need to do approximations, but whether you can put the basic dynamical system into an operator form, first question. Second, having done that, can you perturb your system? That is, do something less than what you were doing before, and then create another operator, which will be an approximating operator. And then after having created that operator, 
how close is that operator to the given operator that you had created, right? That also one has to verify. This is, this is the topic of the next lecture, but it is true. In many, many situations, one can do it, but there is no uh, recipe, you know, that you do this and you do that, right? I will give you a, such a recipe which will work for any situation, but that is not going from infinite dimensional space to a finite rank space. There, there is no recipe like that in general. It has to depend on the particular situation. Srimai, I think we need to stop now because I need to have a cup of coffee. Because sure, sir. I, sure, sure, sir. Sure, I, sir. We, we, I, will, we, we will continue very shortly again. Please have your break. Yeah, I'll need about 15 minutes. Huh? Yeah, sure, sure, sir. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, bye. Yeah, bye. Thank you, sir. I'm leaving this. Yeah. So all participants are requested to join the second lecture on the fresh link that you received in your email. The same link will not work for the next lecture. Please remember this. You please uh, join in the second link. Srimai, you are sending me the second link, right? It is there in the mail that I sent you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you.